Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm David Logan. I'm the chair of the British Institute at Ankara. Uh, this evening, as you know, we have Professor Maureen Freely with us, which is fantastic. Um, I, I'd like to say that I've known Maureen since she was a child because uh, I lived in Istanbul 45 years ago and knew her parents. I don't actually remember Maureen, which is clearly <laughs> that's a serious omission on my part. Um, in any case, we've known each other for, for many years, and I've known her family for many years, and I'm delighted she's here. Uh, she, uh, is, she was educated in Radcliffe, uh, she was born in, born in uh, the United States, then born up in Turkey, then went back to the United States, and she's now uh, holds a chair at Warwick University. And I guess she's best known as the translator of five or handbook novels, uh, and she's chairman of the Journal Centers Association. Um, but she is, does other things as well. She is a distinguished novelist in her own right. She, her next novel is coming out next month. Uh, and she, of course, as I think many people know, campaigns actively on behalf of press freedoms and rights in Turkey. Uh, I think uh, the flyer about her Talks even tells everything you need to know, but it is extraordinary. I think that um, until a few years ago, those of us who followed Turkish literature might have known about Yasha Kemal and then, of course, the Nobel Prize winner Orhan Pamuk. But there has been an extraordinary flowering, uh, contemporary flowering as well, with Elif Shafak. But to give you some idea, I think what's happened uh, this year, Turkey was the featured country, the featured uh, country at the International Book Fair in London, which says, as I say, is something about recognition of Turkish literature, contemporary Turkish literature. Um, Maureen has kindly said she'll answer questions afterwards, uh, after she's spoken, and then thereafter, uh, I hope you'll come and join us for a drink next door. Maureen. Thank you very much. I feel very honored to be here uh, speaking to such a um, distinguished group. And also um, to this group, uh, I'm particularly keen to explain how it was uh, that Turkish literature um, came onto the world stage and, um, and is attracting so much interest now. Uh, you will um, probably, when you look back, think, that the main turning point was Orhan Pamuk winning the Nobel Prize. And although that might be the case, um, the, the story is, is much more um, interesting, more complicated, and what we find now is um, that there are many um, and diverse Turkish writers uh, getting audiences even in English. It's very difficult to get into English for um, reasons that we'll go into uh, later, politely. Uh, but even, I would say, even five or six years ago, people would come up to me and say, um, why is it that we, we know only one Turkish writer? And even last summer, um, somebody in a human rights organization I won't name said, well, we want to do something about Turkey, um, but we only know the names of two writers. So uh, that's where we were last summer, and I think things have, cha uh, are, have changed a lot since then, even. Um, before I go on, I should explain, this is not going to be um, a literature lecture, I, um, because I'm um, a great lover of literature, but I'm not a literature person, I'm not a literature scholar studying things from a distance. Uh, it, I, I live and breathe uh, literature, and so my engagement with it is different, and I should explain a few other things about myself so that um, I can make clear why my perspective is a bit different from uh, the perspective of uh, many of my friends who speak on the subject. I, um, when I left Istanbul at the age of 18 um, to go to Harvard, uh, where I studied English and, and comparative literature, I, for various um, uh, adolescent emotional reasons, I was trying to find another country. And I did not study Turkish literature. Um, a good friend and I 
had a little reading group so we could keep up with Turkish writing and actually teach ourselves how to read uh, Turkish literature. Uh, and that was a connection with home. But I studied you know, the, you know, the, the, the Western greats, if you like. Uh, so uh, it was uh, 1890 to the present. Uh, English, American, French, German, <coughs> Spanish. And the great thing that was happening in 1970, because it is that long ago that I was uh, doing this, uh, was that the Latin Americans had um, arrived, just arrived on the stage uh, from the margins. Uh, they were more European um, than any of us, really. But that's, that's my formation. It's still uh, a conversation um, amongst writers that I find fascinating, and particularly fascinating when um, writers not from the, the former centers are, are in communication, doing new things with the ideas that have become stale and, and old in London, New York, and, um, and Paris. Um, and then, um, as David uh, was just mentioning, um, I do, uh, I'm very, very active now in translation networks, and so I've observed how things have changed. But I want to stress again that it's, it's this uh, idea of, of a world conversation of writers uh, and translators that, uh, that inspires me. And so it's not just trying to bring Turkish literature into English, it's trying to bring Turkish writers into that world conversation and maybe bypass London sometime, just go together to Brazil instead. Yeah? Um, I should also uh, just explain briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, what I've translated. Um, I'm uh, best known for translating the, the three, uh, the, five, the five Orhan Pamuk uh, books. Um, that, uh, the first one I translated was Snow. Uh, the, the second one was, was a, a retranslation, if you like, um, or a second translation of the Black Book. Then I did uh, Istanbul, which is a memoir, then a collection of essays, and then um, the, the Museum of Innocence. So those were the, the, uh, the five books. But also, uh, I have an interest in oral history. Uh, there's many, many really interesting oral histories coming out uh, in Turkey. And um, one of my favorites is uh, Anna Anna, my grandmother by Fethiye Çetin, because it's a very beautiful, human, redemptive book about a very difficult subject. Um, and I've just finished translating uh, uh, what might be called a sequel to that, called Turunlar, the grandchildren. Um, uh, in the networks, in the translation networks here, we're very much about uh, working with new translators, emerging translators, young translators. And so I've been um, collaborating with two different translators. Um, one, with one, um, we just completed uh, a translation. Again, it's a second translation of uh, Tampanar's the Time Regulation Institute, which is one of the greatest books of the 20th century. I'm very, very lucky to have been close to that book at all. Um, and uh, also with that uh, same uh, co-translator, uh, we're about to finish a collection of short stories by Said Faik. And, I, and again, it's a completely wonderful, completely wonderful short story writer um, from that middle 20th century area. Oh, and with um, a translation mentee, my translation mentee, John Anglis, uh, we are now embarked on uh, translating two books by a new discovery of ours, and maybe some of you have already read him, called Hasan Ali Toktash. If you haven't read him, um, we'll, we'll try to convert you uh, over the next few years. And also uh, the wonderful short story writer, Sema Kai Gusus. But, that just gives you an impression that uh, it's just me and my friends who are doing those. There are many, many other books coming out in Turkish, uh, in English now, uh, although we're way, way behind the Germans uh, and way, way behind the French in that um, the, um, uh, the editors who are, bringing, who are interested in these books here in New York uh, tend to uh, know those very um, advanced editors in France and Germany and often get a lot of their uh, suggestions uh, first from those editors. Anyway, but I want to turn the clock back now and uh, look at the way it was and uh, look, uh, what was happening before um, OP, um, Orhan Pamuk, 
and uh, what happened while he was uh, the only one on the stage and then look at what happened afterwards. And I, uh, I will try to keep reminding myself and reminding you that we're not just talking about novels here. There's the great tradition of Turkish poetry, there is drama, um, and then there's a, the, there's a short story. Uh, but the, uh, partly because I'm a novelist uh, myself, I'll inevitably be talking um, most about novels, and indeed most of the books uh, that have come out are, are, are novels. Um, the Cold War, um, how many of you remember Turkey during the Cold War? Just a few, okay. Yes. Um, when I grew up there, it, it did. It was the most beautiful place in the world, and, world, and sometimes it seemed like the most cut off. Um, and uh, what I remember uh, in the um, kind of literary circles that my parents um, were you know, had entry to, there was uh, in the arts and in literature a passionate engagement with everything that was going on in Europe, everything that was going on in the US, uh, and um, there was no conversation. You know, it was, uh, it, nobody seemed to see us, uh, nobody seemed to know what was going on, and uh, it used to, um, what well, bothered everybody, I think, uh, it was, uh, people just assumed that it was just always going to be like this. And uh, the, I would say, um, I grew up in the Anglophone, Sec, you know, sort of sphere of influence, if you like, in Istanbul. But I would say, looking back on those early years, 50s and, and 60s, uh, the French influence uh, was uh, stronger uh, in, in the arts. Um, and uh, writers uh, had, you know, it's not to say that they were involved in politics, but uh, their relation to the state was, was all important, where they uh, allied with the Republican project, or were they members of a banned left-wing party? Um, and if, if the latter, were they in, in the usual restaurant where we'd see them, or were they in jail? And uh, if they were in jail, how soon would they come out? And uh, how were the uh, writers who were part of those collectivities, how did they look after each other? So, that, so there was a very, very... Uh, um, difficult but quite romantic sense of you know, what writers did for um, who they wrote for. They wrote for their friends and, and, and for you know, just open any you know, look at any Nazim Hikmet poet. He's he's addressing you know the people and uh, and uh, uh, of course as I said before you know the the, the great form um, <clears throat> is poetry. Um, you know Yashar Kemal is. Um, uh, making his mark both in, in Turkey and outside Turkey. Uh, but it's not something people go into uh, for the money. As far as translation is concerned, there's an awful lot going in, and there's very, very little going out. If you look at the, there is a bibliography of books um, that have gone from uh, Turkish into English, and during the 50s and 60s, it would just be you know, a little drip here and a little drip there, a little drip here, and so on. And so there was never, ever a context. Um, it was some curiosity that would wander in, and, um, and there would be no follow through. Because it was the Cold War, um, there were always um, a few spaces uh, open for anybody who wanted to um, uh, position him or herself as um, a witness of injustice, of, as a voice of conscience, uh, as a dissident, uh, and this is particularly, um, for me, it seemed to be particularly so after Solzhenitsyn. Um, there was always that, and, and those, those places are still, those thrones are still there for people who want them. Um, so that was the way it was um, when Orhan and I, and I were small. I should say, uh, he's only six weeks older than me, but I know better than him. Um, and then uh, the, if you go into the time, is when we had just begun, I, I began writing at the same time as Orhan, and I published before he did. Um, <laughs> uh, in the West, there was just a great wall of indifference about uh, things Turkish. It didn't matter what language you were writing in, whether it was English or French or German or, or, or Turkish. It was just uh, um, nobody, nobody was interested. And um, as uh, the uh, publishing um, industry become, became more and more financialized, um, uh, here, 
they just say, oh, the readers aren't interested. We can't publish anything that the readers aren't interested in. So, so it, it became uh, more so uh, than, than before. But um, strangely, you know, after the 1980 coup, which is not happily remembered in this room or anywhere else, uh, there was, in the years following that, not exactly following it, but uh, uh, not so long afterwards, a renaissance both in uh, Turkish publishing and in Turkish writing. And so uh, one of the uh, first uh, people to, uh, writers, uh, to make um, her mark uh, in, this, in this new time, also outside Turkey, is Latife Tekin, who is still being published here. Uh, very, well, Marquesian, if you like, Marquesian feminist, um, uh, very, uh, also very left, uh, very, so, um, and then we, of course we have uh, uh, Orhan. Now, he follows, uh, he's, he's part of the tradition of Turkish writing in, in the ways that we've described, but um, he's also um, a writer of a type that we kind of take for granted here, and is it, you know, a writer with a career, uh, and a, a writer who has to work, work very, very hard for a career. Um, uh, and I'd say amongst my writer friends here, we, um, don't jump up and joy at the idea of uh, doing an awful lot of publicity, uh, but it's some, one of the things that you have, you know, you have to do, you're expected to do. But uh, he, um, uh, when he was uh, starting to do well in Turkey, um, he took um, the promotion of books to a new level, phenomenally new level, and, uh, and so he got a, a lot of resentment for that. And also, there was ten always tension between him and his friends because they felt that he wasn't giving enough time to the common cause or whatever. However, if you look at his record during that um, during those years when he's just trying to be by himself and finish his novels, he is uh, when he thinks it's important. And increasingly, there are many important things. Um, he uh, is part of various uh, um, uh, protests or. Um, statements, particularly on, on um, Kurdish rights and so on and so forth. Uh, but he's also uh, working very, very hard um, to get known abroad. And that's the story I know very well. Um, uh, I think that he, you know, I, I don't think that any writer should feel like they're writing on the margins, whether it's a, a woman in the 1950s in England or, uh, you know, a Native American in the 1960s in the U.S. Nobody should have to write on the margins. And so I completely understand why he uh, wanted to be taken seriously uh, outside, um, you know, not just in Turkey, but uh, to, to a larger audience. And I would say, like a lot of the writers who um, have followed on from him, um, he is um, addressing questions um, about the East-West fiction, if you would call it, that um, are, are involving all of us now. He talks about um, you know, rapid modernization in a way that anybody's involved, well, in the globalized world, that's something that we're thinking about all the time. <coughs> and so one of the reasons I uh, uh, fell in love um, with the books that the man uh, is that uh, he had, uh, he was using formal exper experiments um, that uh, I, um, of a type that I knew very well from um, my, um, my Europeans and, of course, my Latin, even more so my, my Latin Americans. And he was doing, uh, and he was turning them on their head um, and opening up new ways of looking at, at the country I knew best and that he, uh, that he knew best. So um, I, you know, I um, loved his, uh, and still love his books because of that, that uh, uh, I can only call it magic because it is a trick. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trick of perception, what he, what he does. And, um, but, uh, so, from the time that he was being published in English, which comes after uh, his passage into French and to in German and a lot of other languages, uh, I was reviewing his books, and then I was advising him on, on what to do. And because um, I was in talking to the other people in the, in the literary world, who also thought his writing was wonderful. <coughs> um, I was aware of how hard his, you know, his literary friends, as well as his publishers, were working in this country. And then when I became his translator, I found out that there were these little enclaves in this 
not every country you can think of. Um, my point is they were working really hard, and they were working really hard for about 15 years. And he was working very hard, and that is, I'm afraid, what you have to do. Um, you might have mixed feelings about um, what this means uh, with, or what it implies. Uh, one thing that's very difficult for <coughs> Turkish writers and um, writers from what we can call them emerging, uh, you know, the, the, the emerging strong economies or whatever, there's <coughs> an increasing interest in the country and they're looking for somebody to explain it to them. And um, no matter how hard you say, I'm not here to talk about um, politics, I'm here to talk about my books, the questions were always going to return to it and return to it. Um, and uh, so he was in that position and it was very, very difficult. But uh, he was also friends with a lot of journalists based in Istanbul. And so when the story was going uh, on a hunger strike that he'd been involved with ending uh, the Ashakirov, for example, he would give short interviews. And he wasn't terribly well known then, but he got into the habit of offering an analysis if he felt it was going to be uh, helpful or interesting. And, um, and then, of course, um, uh, he um, says, those words. And I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room what the words are. Um, uh, he uh, is speaking off the record, and um, but he's taped, and, uh, and so um, he's uh, quoted as talking about uh, the Armenian question and the Kurdish question in the in the Swiss uh, press. And within seconds, uh, it's a it's in here yet, and it's the basis of a hate campaign that goes on for a long time. <coughs> and uh, because I was his uh, translator at that time, I can tell you, they couldn't find him, but they could find me because I'm a journalist as well as a translator, and the journalist has to be available. And I was getting um, hundreds, hundreds of uh, calls and emails from all over the world um, because they not because they cared about him, but because th that struggle was waiting is all I can think. Um, and uh, you don't wish that position on your worst enemy, really, to be um, suddenly expected uh, by all the countries in the world to speak um, on behalf of a country where you're undergoing a hate campaign. So you may notice that he doesn't speak about politics very much anymore. Um, but then the novels, uh, the, uh, you will remember uh, when Orhan won the Nobel Prize in 2006. Uh, he um, was um, described as somebody who was so, uh, so wise on you know, the East-West question, uh, the war of civilizations, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, we were on the radio. I think there was, it was a radio program Orhan was on. I was on um, a journalist friend of his. I was in Coventry, he was in New York, the program was running out of Boston, the journalist was in Chicago, and then we had Jada Parla in Istanbul. And um, so the, the, the man interviewing us kept on saying, it's so wonderful how illuminating you are on the war of civilizations, and from all over the world we said, no, 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 no. And then he said it again and again, he, he just couldn't find any other way to, uh, to, to talk about it. Uh, what I also uh, witnessed every time we um, would go around from country to country while he was uh, collecting lots of honors, uh, people would thank him publicly um, for explaining not just Turkey, but that whole part of the world to them. And uh, it's really hard to know what, what to do if your book is taken as a, as a primer. Um, and uh, you know, he would say, well, this is just my view, but Still, people didn't want to, um, basically, uh, he has many faults, but this is not one of them. Uh, it's not his fault that uh, people have a flat reading of the book. The only way forward is to make sure that people have a much deeper understanding of uh, the, the history, the politics, and culture, and a much greater variety of books to, uh, uh, to choose from. Um, so, as I described, uh, a big um, multinational campaign uh, to get this writer into the public eye. It works, it works too well. Um, the, if you go 
translated. There are many times on his travels when he was would be followed by 10, 20 translators. Yes, lots and lots of translators. Uh, and so it's, it's a very, very bizarre world um, in which um, there are these constant invitations to be involved in uh, um, difficult political issues behind the scenes and, and, and publicly. So I'll, I'll draw a curtain over some of that. Um, what happens after the Nobel Prize, as far as uh, Turkish literature in English is concerned, is everybody wants their own work. And um, by now, um, there are, for the first time, and we're talking uh, not quite 10 years ago, there are uh, literary agents for the first time in, in Turkey, very, very dynamic, dynamic literary agents, um, very good at their job. And um, they did what agents should do, which is they work very hard on behalf of all their clients, who were all advertised as the next door So um, that caused um, uh, some, uh, uh, some difficulties. Uh, a lot of books that you know, might have been uh, accepted uh, if they were promoted in a different way were because they were all looking for somebody uh, who wrote like him. And then there are also issues around translation, which we can probably go to uh, later. Um, Turkish is a very, 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 very difficult wonderful, perfect language, uh, very difficult um, to translate in, into English. Um, everything uh, everything is um, backwards and then turned around a little bit if you put it into English. So, um, but the, the good things that are happening um, behind the scenes is that there's a tremendous uh, uh, rise in support for uh, translation inside Turkey. And that's, again, as a result of the um, hard campaign, very, very uh, vigorous campaigning on the part of a few people, uh, Sally Hotpacker being, um, of course, she being one of them. And uh, after a great deal of uh, difficulty, uh, she and, um, and her uh, co-conspirators managed to um, uh, convince the Ministry of Culture to set up um, a translation funding uh, body called TEDA. So uh, if you look at, uh, I don't think there is a single uh, novel being translated from Turkish into English or uh, book of poetry aside from uh, um, Orhan Pamuk and Elie Shafak, which is not being funded by the TEDA project. But that's how important it is. Uh, and, um, and, it's, and it's very uh, fair, it's translating, it's funding translations in lots and lots of different languages, and it, and it tries very, very hard not to have, uh, have favorites. The, um, the other things that made a big difference, uh, Turkey was the guest of honor at Frankfurt in 2008, I think, 2008. And uh, there was, uh, that had a huge impact on, um, they had a huge uh, a literature program around it, and the number of translations going from Turkish into German went way, way, way up. And as well, there are also many more translators, German translators of Turkish, uh, than there are at the moment uh, going into English. So that was a big thing. Um, and, um, and then, of course, uh, there was the uh, London Book Fair this year, which wasn't on the, uh, as grand a scale. As, um, as Frankfurt, but it was um, the British Council and many uh, related organizations uh, put a huge effort over a year uh, into getting um, a very diverse group of 20 writers over and many, many other writers over different parts of the year. And they had a cultural program that was mostly based in, in London, but also in Wales and in Scotland. And it was really, really uh, impressive. But again, it was a huge amount of work and, and also public money that went into that. Um, the, um, it's still a very important thing for a writer in what we still stupidly call a minority language um, to get into English because of the way that publishing has changed. So Anglophone publishing uh, rules the, the world. Chinese is waiting. It hasn't got there yet. So. Um, to get into a lot of other minority languages, you have to go through English. And um, 
so that's what's um, that's why it's so important to get in here. Do you, do you know what the percentage is of um, work in translation um, in this country? Well, we, we can't be completely sure because nobody bothers to count it, but it's between um, uh, 2 and 4%. Right? And that's all the literatures of the world fighting for that 2, uh, two to 4%. Um, so um, the translation networks that I'm part of, where um, uh, very, most of the translators in the networks tend to have education, uh, educational formations like me, you know, love literature, didn't go into banking like their mothers told them to, and um, still not making ends meet, but um, it's a tremendous amount of fun. And what we, um, but what we're really um, most interested in is, is world literature and the way in which a book written in Colombia will uh, appeal in some way to a writer in Turkey or Greece or Lebanon, and it will change the way they write, and then they'll put out a book which will then be read by the people in Colombia and Brazil and, and South Africa, and will give them an idea. It's like that kind of, um, that's the kind of idea that we have. And uh, so what we've done at this end is, um, I say we, um, I just tag along. Um, I turn up at all these places. I, we, none of us know who owns um, these projects. There's the International Foreign Fiction Prize, um, which uh, uh, shortlists um, six books a year and um, gives a prize that is shared by the translator. Uh, there is the uh, Literary Translation Center at the London Book Fair, which gets more than, um, more than a thousand visitors in just three days for, for our events. Uh, there's uh, the Free Word Center, which is our version of what you call in Germany, in Germany a literary, literature house. And, um, and they're tremendously involved with um, translation, and they've started various translation funds and residencies. And we do mentorships. Um, we, last year, we ran um, in, in partial association with the Translators Association. Um, 16 mentorships, two of those mentorships were in Turkish, one in poetry and, and one in one in, fiction, uh, in prose. And uh, so um, all of these activities, and we work very closely with, with the group of publishers, mostly small publishers. All the interesting, almost all the interesting things are happening right now amongst the small publishers who have um, more freedom uh, to um, um, make editorial decisions based on their own interests. Uh, the very, very good editors who are in the larger firms are very constrained. They still manage to, um, uh, to uh, publish interesting books, a few of them, just a very, very few of them. But uh, we work with all of them. And so it really is a, a very, very active and vibrant sector. And so it's in that context that we see um, the number of books um, uh, coming out of Turkish and English going up. Between 2000 and 2006, there were 19 uh, books uh, that were published in that direction. Uh, and that's including poetry, short story uh, novels. And between 2006 and 2012, it went up to 41. And the, uh, many of the translations I do won't be counted in that uh, because many of the publishers that uh, we, you know, uh, you know, Britain-based uh, translators work for are actually in the U.S. So the, the figures don't, uh, if you added the, the U.S. figures, you'd have something much, much higher, and, um, and you'd see that, um, that, that um, doubling of, of figures or more. We're, we're going to see um, that number go way, way up over the next few years. It takes uh, the, the sales that happened at the London Book Fair, it takes, uh, uh, it takes a little bit of while to get the funding. And then it takes a little bit of uh, a year, or in my case, sometimes two, to get the translation finished. And then, of course, the, the editing of a translation uh, is very time consuming. And, um, and we all have day jobs. So. But um, you'll see it's just filtering through in, in, in a while. It's also because it's a more, uh, the, the market here is um, more diverse than, than it used to be, um, there are many more ways in to um, uh, publishing world here than it used to be. Uh, you don't have to, uh, it's, it's great if David wants you, it's great, great, great if uh, Penguin wants you, but you don't have to, you don't have to do that. You don't have to. Uh, you can, um, 
just look at the uh, trajectory of Elif Shafak, um, who um, you know, is uh, another, what I would call hybrid, you know, hybrid uh, like me, and you know, born in Strasbourg, um, educated many, many different, all over Europe, and in Turkey, and in the US, um, worked in the US, and uh, so at a certain point was writing in Turkish and decided that she would, well, not skip the translation, but um, put herself in charge of it. So quite a few of her books are written in English first. And, uh, and then she will have other people, you know, mysteriously have other people translated you know, into Turkish for her. So um, and the way that she um, has positioned herself now, she lives in London uh, most of the year, is uh, she's, a, she's a world writer. I mean, she's a you know, writer from Turkey, but um, not uh, a writer who's going around saying, um, come to me if you want uh, a pronouncement on the Turkish Republic. You know, that's not what she's interested in doing. Uh, she's very feminist, um, and she wants to write to a world constituency for a very different set of reasons. So, um, but uh, what I can say as um, the director of a writing program at Warwick is that uh, more we are, we're seeing more and more uh, uh, young uh, writers from all over the world including Turkey, who want to skip the translation trap altogether and who want to be writing in English, first and foremost. I, I find this very troubling, so I always try to get them to write in both languages at least. But this is something that we're going to, to see happening. And then when that happens, how are we even going to measure um, the, the, the travel of um, Turkish literature into English when it's arriving in English uh, before? Now, one thing that I feel um, I'm very happy that you have Latifi Tekin, I always also mention, you know, Peri Han uh, another um, uh, yeah, very um, flamboyant, idiosyncratic, brilliant uh, Turkish writer. And then you have such a good opportunity, he used to be a banker, he did what his mother said, um, and, uh, and then he became a novelist afterwards. Um, and um, all of these uh, writers are with uh, interesting small publishers. Um, and then you have, um, if you're interested in some of the names of, um, of you know, writers to look out for, um, my you know, a preliminary list, Rathan Mungan, who's unbelievably famous in Turkey. Uh, first and foremost, he's a dramatist, uh, but he's a wonderful novelist as well. Unbelievably difficult to translate, but somebody should try. Bejan Matur, one of my favorite poets, uh, who also writes prose. Uh, Oya Baydar, who's a... Um, um, I suppose we'll call her an ex-communist novelist. Ece Tirel Kuran, who's a journalist as, as well as, um, as a novelist, and um, quite uh, controversial. Ayşe Kulin, who um, writes more on the, um, uh, the woman's novel, if you like, the more um, uh, commercial side, um, high-brow uh, commercial side. Uh, Murat Mendes, who is a, a comic writer. Kaya Genç, again, who's a comic novelist. There wasn't quite a, you know, after Aziz Nassim, there wasn't quite a tradition like this, and now, and now there is. Uh, we also had uh, science fiction writers, we had an Islamist science fiction writer uh, with us, and this is just the, you know, the beginning. And if you start looking at uh, Turkish-born writers in various European countries, it becomes more diverse uh, still. Um, uh, Sergei Emine um, who writes in German, but it's a very, very kind of gospel writer in Turkish, uh, German. So um, if you take the group of people together, you just see that um, people are, you know, the more there are out there, the people saying, how can the same country produce all these uh, amazing and very, very different people? And you know, what else is going on there? Um, and I think we, we, we've, we've reached that point. But I'm very, um, one thing that makes me very sad is that um, the, you know, the, the 20th century, is not represented. The 21st century is going to be okay. 21st, 20th century has so many great writers in it. So many um, writers, uh, like for example, Tan Pinar, who died thinking they were forgotten uh, and who have been discovered since. There's been a renaissance of understanding and appreciation of 20th century literature in Turkey as well as the political um, uh, divisions of the particular time have, have disappeared. And so, I, I was going around a few years ago saying, well, you know, why don't 
you know, why don't you just take these lovely books and do a everyone's library of, of all of them and just look after them and make sure the translations are good and the copy editing is good. And I got a lot of blank looks. Um, but I still think it might happen. The, the, the blank looks I would get from very, you know, people who are passionate about Turkish literature, they'd say, but nobody will be interested. Uh, there's still that feeling, especially among those of us who are a thousand years old, that, you know, that they can't really be interested, but I'm telling you, they are. And so that's why I was really um, very, very glad to be able to um, be involved with bringing Tan Pinar's uh, Time Regulation as a kid, the ultimate book about um, the absurdities of modernization and, and um, the bureaucratic modern state. Um, and why I'm um, so glad that the jewels, those jewels, uh, short stories by Sight Lake, will um, travel into another language for a while. And um, I think that the more we confer, I'm, I'm not an expert on Turkish literature, so I, I'm always asking what else should I read, what else should I read. I think the more that we, as readers, talk to each other and also to um, people like us, uh, you know, the, the translators, um, the, you know, the, the more that will we'll, um, you know, build up that kind of conversation from which you know, great uh, new translations, uh, you know, new translations of um, the old cla the, the classics uh, can come out. Um, I mentioned those mentorships earlier. Um, I'm afraid I was surprised for one of them. That was very embarrassing. Um, but my, I had to uh, meet with, this is a Project by the British, British Council, and I had to meet with the 16, 15 um, uh, shortlisted uh, translators. Um, about a third of them were uh, native English speakers, and the others were, um, well, Turks, but had um, with an English parent or who had lived here for a long time, or who had um, simply begun um, studying uh, translation work. And they were completely wonderful, completely wonderful people. And I felt really horrible that the prize just went to um, a, a SOAS boy. Okay, so the, and so but John Angus is a wonderful person, so he said, why don't we carry on working uh, together whenever you're in Turkey? So every time I go to Turkey, we try to pull together a group just to uh, talk about translation or to go over a translation and so on. And in the run-up to the um, uh, London Book Fair, uh, Bill Swainson, who's um, editor at Bloomsbury, who's, um, he does probably, he's one of the two people in mainstream publishing who just does a phenomenal amount for, for literature and translation. And he decided he was going to discover a new Turkish writer. He just decided, British Council flew him down to Turkey, so while well, he was there, he decided he was going to do that. And um, he told me this on a very, on probably the worst January of my life, and I said, Bill, I, you know, I can't, I, I have a job, I have other problems in my life, I can't, you know, can't research all this for you. So, but then I realized that my, my, trans, little, my young translators could do that, and so we formed into an informal club, and he had all these, these names that he wanted, uh, these, these new authors that he wanted to um, uh, report on, and so um, my biggest feet irregulars, um, read them, discussed them, discussed them with me, wrote reports, and that's how we uh, managed to uh, sell two novels by Hassan Ali Toptas to, uh, um, to Bloomsbury, which is a completely wonderful publisher. So um, I, I think that that's the way forward, um, uh, working with young translators, but also working with young translators who are readers. And in, in this country, um, trying to convince young writers that they should also be young translators as well, so that uh, we can become a little less isolated in this country and a little bit more enriched by the wonderful things coming from Turkey and um, the other countries we won't mention tonight. I'll stop here because you might want to ask me a few questions that I'll then evade. There's a roving mic, so I'm going to be um, very headmistressy about the, the mic. So, so there's a uh, front and then there's a two rows back, yes. Thank you very much. I wondered if you could comment on whether you think the art of translation, the, the creative work implicit in translation, is duly recognized and valued by the broader world, and if I may say so, in particular by the academic community. 
May, may I ask if you're a translator? I'm an academic. <laughs> you're an academic, okay. <laughs> Editing, among other things, and I know that it is not valued. No, no. no. Translation is a kind of counterpart to that. But because uh, I'm, I mean, I, although I'm not a scholar, I am an academic because I, you know, I don't know how this happened. Uh, but um, we have this research assessment, research, research excellence framework, sorry, the acronym keeps changing. Um, but the, the last time it went around, I, I actually was, the head of the department wrote to me and said, could you please um, explain um, how each of your translations has impacted on world civilization differently? I mean, that was, that's how little faith they have in translation. Um, so we're just, the, we're fighting that fight at, at, at Warwick. Um, we are um, uh, uh, gathering numbers and um, I, I, if you give me your email, I'll make sure that you get involved in our campaigns. Do, do you um, actually teach translation at work, or is this part of these? Uh, so, this is, it was my, so it was the, whatever translations I'd done in that, uh, you know, that six-year period, and I had to justify each one differently, but also prove that it had impacted on, on you know, world civilization. Yeah. Um, but I would say the uh, literary translation is... Um, the only way that you can begin to understand what literary tra translation involves is if you go to these translation slams that they are actually um, um, putting on in more and more places, and we'll have two translators uh, side by side having both worked on the same draft, and then they go through explaining what their, um, how they made their decisions. Uh, we had one of those for Turkish at the, at the London Book Fair, and um, the it's particularly it's particularly difficult uh, in a country uh, like uh, Turkey, which has, where language is so politicized. Uh, so here people, you know, if you're not uh, an academic, people don't really care that much. Um, but people care very, very much about how their, you know, Turkish books are being taken, what's happening to them when they, when, when they go abroad. And um, if they'll, they take the position that, that you know, most people in the world take, which is a, a translation should be faithful, it should be literal, then you get into trouble right away. I mean, as a novelist, because I, I started translating um, as a novelist without realizing, and so what I did was I tried to get to the center of each book uh, in just the way I would with my own novel if I sat down to work on it in, in the morning. And so everything comes you know, from understanding what the author is doing to create certain effects. So as a novelist, you get to have uh, you, can, you can make quite good guesses. And so um, the first thing, for example, is to make sure that if there's a trance being set up in the, in, in the, t the original text, there needs to be a trance set up in, in, in the English or the French, or it's not going to do its job as a piece of literature. And, it goes on, and then, of course, the trance is the, kind of the easy term. The, every single little decision, you know, what temperature each word has, it's not just what it means. Um, so that's kind of difficult um, to uh, uh, explain to somebody who thinks that you have helped a novelist uh, um, sell his country to advance his own career. Um, I mean, it's, it's not the, the, the right starting point for that discussion, but I'm hoping with lots of you know, conversations with young translators in Turkey and, and here, uh, with people who all love the books and where the, where the stakes aren't so high that they, a, a tradition of literary translation can, can take hold. Does that answer, answer your question? Okay. You know, there was a behind, yes. Hi, this is a much more superficial question, but as a keen, oh, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> as a keen student of sort of Turkish literature and English translation, and someone who's not... You're, you're a student of... Well, no, just sort of amateur sort of reader of... Um, Turkish works, English translation. It's, it's always very difficult to sort of track down these sort of works that you're sort of describing and then these authors. I mean, other than sort of reading the book review section of Cornucopia magazine. I mean, where could, could you give us some tips on how we're going to sort of track down these writers that you're referring to and sort of are there sort of is this is this are these works being collected somewhere where we'll be able to sort of track them down other than just happening to come across them? Well, that's a, that's a, a very good uh, question, and if I had, um, um, if I wanted to add another 
portfolio to my multi-portfolio life. I think, I think somebody should, should actually create a resource um, where, that's, uh, where that's happening. I mean, what I, what I would really like would, would be uh, uh, something that's not just about Turkish literature, but about the literature of the entire region in which all the writers are, are together um, reading each other's books and so on. Uh, there is a, um, uh, a website I can give you the details of that's, um, that's putting an awful lot out. Um, uh, a lot of it is student translations and uh, you know, collecting the books and so on. The problem is, in any country, including this, um, once you get writers, you get cliques. And so it's very hard. It has to be really somebody who's yeah, loving it uh, and um, not angry about what so-and-so did at, at, at the May Hunter yesterday and so on and so forth, yeah. Um, but uh, what can I do for you uh, in the meantime? The, the Foreign Fiction Prize is a good place to, be, uh, to get it. It doesn't, it's had an awful lot of Turkish books on the short list. You'll see them in context with, all, with the other books coming up. Um, and um, I hope that one day soon you'll look online and see that I've done something about it, or I've talked somebody else into doing something about it. But thank you for the suggestion. Any uh, other um, people want to take their lives in their hands? Yes. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, do you translate poetry? No. No. I mean, I just did translate a poem because it was uh, in um, uh, in Turul the kind of sequel to uh, my grandmother. They tried to keep five people talking about their experiences of finding out who their grandparents really were. And, um, you know, I had no choice. I just had to, I had to translate this Kurdish poet writing in Turkish. And, uh, you know, I, I, I said, could you please give this to a poet? But I don't think they have. So don't read it. struck by your two to four percent figure. Yes. I was wondering whether you might give a very similar lecture if you were talking about Arabic literature or Greek literature or any other foreign literature, if you like, and uh, whether there are certain languages which fare better than Turkish, and if so, why, and others that fare worse. Uh, well, I think I have uh, attended lectures given by other people on, um, on those subjects, and uh, yes, you have the problems of, um, of you know, writing from the margins, um, and uh, with Arabic you have the problems of post-colonialism, uh, both before, yeah, pre, yeah, well, during and post-colonialism, so, so it's, it's even more, uh, more, more fraught there. Um, the reason why uh, there are still minority languages and, you know, marginal uh, literatures it's simply the way that world literature was constructed uh, from the very beginning, um, but particularly from the 19th century on. Uh, the novel, in particular, is, is you know, as a form, is, is the guilty party, and, um, and you know, where, were the, where were the great novels uh, being um, you know, written in the, in the 19th century? Even the Russian novel is not marginalized, if you believe it. Yeah, so, so very much um, City of Light, uh, uh, London, uh, New York, uh, uh, perhaps Germany, forming taste, forming the, the subject matter as well, and uh, the idea that uh, in, in the beginning that uh, a novel is a report to the bourgeoisie about um, the, uh, the nation they're building or not, uh, and then with the beginning of modernism, it's all about uh, form. Or hand public is very much part of that formal, uh, that conversation around form and what you can what you can do to it, um, and it's all been um, up until very very recently very much uh, um, controlled from the centre. What's happening now all over the world is that that's breaking down, and uh, in my opinion, that's a very good thing. Culturally, it's breaking down, but anglophone publishing is rule, as I said, it rules the world, and it's not just. Um, that they're moving uh, the world, they um, are uh, very much imposing, or, well, yeah, I'd say imposing um, you know, the mark of templates. You know, so, science fiction, um, the woman's novel, um, the Nobel novel, um, 
the, um, the exotic novel with lots and lots of uh, sites and spells of India. Yeah? So um, it's a kind of commercialization of literature that, we, that any of us working in, in, uh, in that field you know, feel very strongly. Uh, it, it's reflected in every single decision, every editor, publisher we know is making. So uh, right now, um, as a former judge of the Foreign Fiction Prize, I find it a great relief that uh, the writers from the so-called marginal countries seemed, they had lots of difficulties as well, but they're, they're free uh, from these commercial pressures for the moment. So, anyway, the world's changing. Yes. I think, um, I think I could, he's going to shut me up. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. I'm going to do anything. Just one last question. Yes. How do you compare and contrast um, the difference between translating and interpreting? I'm talking about the simultaneous interpreting. We have a, um, a cousin, my husband and I, who is a simultaneous interpreter and, um, between French and English and half in Danish as well. And it's fascinating hearing her stories about that. And I'm just wondering how that would you be a simultaneous translator in Turkish English both ways? No. <laughs> way. I would say the difference between translation and, uh, and simultaneous interpreting is I can't do the second thing. Um, uh, I, I Does it take more time? Or it's, it's a, it's it's a, translating takes more time? So you have to study, I mean, even if you have both languages um, you know, in, your, in your DNA, you still have to study for a long time. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And it's, it's particularly difficult um, uh, uh, from Turkish um, because yes. the people they're trying to they're it's more difficult because um, it's more difficult. very, very long sentences and because Turkish uh, doesn't have to tie the sentence together until the very end, the word you need most in English. <laughs> if if so, you don't have to wait for a long time. So in a way, it's, yeah. it's, it's obviously easier in, but, in French and English. We've got to various conferences in which there are literary translators and also interpreters, and it's completely fascinating um, yeah. uh, talking to them um, because uh, we are related. They're just better. Yeah. Uh, no, fascinating. Thanks very much. I think, I think, Richard, I'll have to ask you to keep your question until after us, along with my question, which is obviously about what uh, an Islamist science fiction writer is like. Nice guy. Yeah. Okay, but thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Corey. I mean, I, I'm sure all of us have learned an awful lot from what you've had to say. I mean, I found particularly interesting the, the broad context you provided, uh, you know, I mean, different broad contexts, both historical, chronological, but also uh, your point about um, Turkish, uh, Turkish translation in the context of, of, of what's happening globally. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that, as I say, everyone else has learned a lot too, so please join me in, in thanking Professor Freed enormously, very much indeed, for a very interesting lecture. Thanks so much. Thank you.